Good morning. Welcome to worship with the White Plains Presbyterian Church on the second Sunday of Lent. I'm here with Chris Davis, our worship leader today, in front of her apartment. Behind us is the Thomas H. Slater Center. All of you should know that the food that we regularly collect at church and all of the food and funds collected by the youth group during this year's Super Bowl of Caring are distributed here by the Emergency Ecumenical Food Pantry. Thank you for supporting this effort and your neighbors here in White Plains. Let us worship God. From water to wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. Ancestor of nations to the crucified Christ, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. Follow Jesus on the Lenten path, for where he is, he will be also. Great, Great is God's faithfulness, our God, our Redeemer and Sustainer. For this reason, we make our confession without fear and in the assurance that in honest confession, God is drawing us nearer to the work of redemption and repair. Let us pray. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste to the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and we turn them into bonds of oppression. God have mercy upon us, heal us and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Our prayers continue with a brief time of silence. Amen. My friends, there is one thing that is true and that never changes, and it is this. God has loved us, she loves us still, and she will love us always. In Christ we are forgiven and freed to serve with joy. And since God has drawn us close in Christ, let us reach out to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you, Chris. Let us pray. Gracious God, in rushing waters in a dry wilderness, in every season and circumstance, we need your sustaining by the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news among us today so that we may repent and believe and see anew how the time is fulfilling and the kingdom has come near. In Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, amen. <clears throat> our scripture reading this morning is Genesis 17, 1-7. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. 
God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. The Lenten journey, as seen through the Sunday scriptures, is one of grounding ourselves in God's promises so that we can do the hard work of repentance and be embraced by Jesus' resurrection. Last week, for example, we read God's covenant with Noah and with all creation, that love is not destructive and does not lash out in anger or frustration when things go wrong, that God will never again if God ever really did, harm the earth to teach us a lesson. Rather, God's love will only work with and through this broken world, no matter how bad things get. Now, this might at times frustrate us, but it is God's way. Paul will later write, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not irritable or arrogant or self-serving, but abides in all things. This is the rainbow promise, God's way, the first covenant. In today's reading, God makes a second covenant with Abraham and Sarah. This covenant is a covenant of relationship, of faithful and loving relationship. I will be your God, and you will be my people. God has moved Abraham and Sarah to a new land, and there they will be fruitful and multiply. God will give them descendants, descendants who are to be a blessing to all people. The blessing's not just for them, but for all. And this blessing is to be reflected in their new identity, in how they are known to others. Abram and Sarai receive new names. And with this identity as God's people, Abraham and Sarah and all the generations to come are to learn from the land, to live lightly upon it and in peace with their neighbors. I want to repeat that. They are to learn from the land, live lightly upon it, and in peace with their neighbors. That's God's way. This is reiterated in the third covenant given through Moses when he tells God's newly liberated people that the land in the hill country of Canaan, the land to which God has led them, is not like the land of Egypt. It is not abundantly watered by the regular flooding of the Nile and so easily cultivated, but it is watered by the very hand of God, by rain and by dew, in such a way that it can sustain generations forever, but only if lived humbly upon. God's people are called to become what Potawatomi author Robin Wall Kimmerer calls naturalized to place. Naturalization is the word we use when someone foreign-born becomes a citizen, when they take up the way of life indigenous to a place, respecting the land, the laws, and the people who are living there. Abraham and after him Isaac and Jacob do just this, and it is what brings honor to the name of their God. I've only recently learned to see this process of naturalization and respect for the land, laws, and people of a place in the blessing given to Abraham by Melchizedek in Genesis 14. This is a passage whose beauty and ultimate tragedy I had never seen before. Abraham who had settled among the Canaanites near the Oaks of Mamre, has just helped the local kings defend their land from colonial invasion. And so Melchizedek, referred to both as a king and a Canaanite priest, brings forth bread and wine at the sacred shrine in Salem, pledges friendship between his and Abraham's families, and blesses Abraham in the name of El Elyon, the creator spirit of the land of Canaan. And, and, and Abraham, in turn, swears by El Elyon, the creator spirit of Canaan, that he, Abraham, will not take any of the property or possessions belonging to the Canaanites, but will live in peace with the indigenous population. They, in turn, welcome Abraham to live out his covenant faith as a co-steward of the land. I'm building this up carefully because it is really easy to forget. 
And that's because later, Israel will make war on the Canaanites, on the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the Perizzites, the indigenous populations of Canaan. And they will take the land exclusively for themselves. Now, Scripture exaggerates their success, as can be seen by the continued conflict with the Canaanites that runs down through all the kings and the prophets, and even down to Jesus' day, when Galilee is referred to as the Galilee of the Gentiles. But the relationship is never what it was intended to be again. The covenant is broken. Friends, the reason we call the Bible our scripture and that God can speak to us through it is that the Bible is not merely a record of the mighty acts of God or an instruction book for walking with God, but is also a record of failure, faithlessness, and falling away for us to learn from. And it's not merely a record of sin and sinners, but a record of people believing that they're acting justly while they are in fact sinning and claiming to have God on their side even while they are taking from others. The third commandment against invoking God's name in vain is not about using curse words, but about abusing the name of God or abusing others in the name of God in invoking God's name to defend injustice. Once we recognize this, and that we are complicit in the same kind of behavior, then we are drawn into right relationship with the God who works repair and reparation and our ultimate redemption. That right there is a good place to be on the second Sunday in our Lenten journey. By now, many of you may have read or heard that I have rescheduled my sabbatical with the church council. The sabbatical will begin after Easter and run through the end of June, which will have me back by the time we're ready to have gathered worship again. The church council and the personnel committee are actively working on plans to assure that we have inspiring worship, that our online community continues, that the staff are cared for and pastoral care is available to everyone. You may have noticed that the midweek email and this worship video this morning came to you from Stella rather than from me. In addition, several pastors in the White Plains community have also offered themselves to us to ensure that not everything lands on Lynn or Sarah. And we'll have a meeting in a few weeks to talk about what else we can be doing during these hopefully final months of everything being remote. A sabbatical is, after all, supposed to be as much an opportunity for the congregation as it is for the pastor. So, a bit about what I will be doing. The sabbatical planned for last fall was built upon the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. having said, we live in a world house. I wanted to go and experience some of the rooms in this world house from which you, members of the White Plains Presbyterian Church, have come to experience the land, the peoples, the cultures, and the worship that informs our life together here. Now, if that can be thought of as one side of a coin, the current sabbatical plan is the other side of the coin. It's built upon, what Dr. Built upon Dr. King's invitation to take an X-ray to the necessarily complex and detailed history that disfigures our society and to reject and feel the shame deeply woven into our consciousness. And here's how he put it. In his 1964 book, Why We Can't Wait, Dr. King wrote, for too long, the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. The surgery necessary to extract it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it is necessary to X-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. Our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Negroes on our shore, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. From the 16th century forward, blood flowed in battles over racial superiority. We are perhaps the only nation which tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its 
its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today, he says, we have not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for this shameful episode. Our literature, our films, our drama, our folklore, all exalt it. It is this tangled web of prejudice from which many Americans now seek to liberate themselves without realizing just how deeply it has been woven into our consciousness. I plan to use my sabbatical to walk the Potawatomi Trail of Death from Twin Lakes, Indiana to Osawatomi, Kansas. In September of 1838, Potawatomi Chief Menominee and his people were forced at the point of bayonet to walk 660 miles and relocate to Kansas. Everyone's familiar with the Cherokee Trail of Tears. This is the other Trail of Tears, the Northern Trail of Tears which together with the Navajo and the Nez Perce long walks bring shame to our country. I walk as the physical and spiritual descendant of Irish, English, Scots, German, and Swiss families who settled on land dwelt upon or taken from the Potawatomi in the 1830s. As I walk, I will consider my own necessarily complex and detailed history with settler colonialism, of complicity with broken promises, covenants, and treaties to build relationships with people my ancestors displaced, and to allow myself to be drawn into God's work of repair, reparation, and ultimate redemption. I'm going to culminate this experience with a two-week intensive summer session at a seminary in Indiana called Decolonizing Discipleship. This is hard work, and important work, as Dr. King reminds us. And it is work that white people in particular must do themselves, as poet Audre Lorde said long ago. But it is not different in kind from the self-examination that we are all called to in Lent. James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Lent invites us to a close look at the lives that we are living and the distance we are from God's purpose at the brokenness of the world and our complicity with it, and God's call to be repairers of the breach and the restorers of streets to live in. And what we can discover is, that, is the God of grace whose name we abuse when we take it for granted. May God support and strengthen you as you continue your journey through this season, and may Christ await you and surprise you on the way. Amen. The past two weeks in Jeff's sermon messages, we have heard about God's covenantal promises with God's people. And the two covenants that uh, Jeff focused on in scripture are remembered by signs in nature. The first uh, last week, we heard about the rainbow sign given to Noah. And this week, uh, Abraham is told to look up at the stars and um, to see them as, as how numerous his descendants will be. So we have these two signs, the rainbow and the stars. And uh, this week here at Stony Point Center, we started tapping maple trees. And I've always felt that the flowing of the sap is a sign of itself, a, a reminder of the promises that God makes to us of the sweetness and the joy that we um, will experience in life. And this reminder comes, of course, in the bleakest of winter days, just when they seem eternal, the sap rises. Um, this week, I also received a, a, a mailing in my email from um, uh, like an inspirational quote. And this one was from Dorothy Day, reflecting on just that, on, on how our spirits <laughs> struggle during the darkness of winter. And... Um, and what happens when the sap begins to rise, the hope that returns to us. Um, so as I pray with you today, I will read the words that I received from Dorothy Day. And um, they include a kind of prayer recipe that she has for praying in these winter days. 
Um, and then I will just simply invite you to open your eyes to the signs of God's covenant, of God's promises to you in creation, in what you encounter this week. Let us pray. Words from Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. January and February are those months when winter seems interminable and vitality is low. In the face of world events, in the face of the mystery of suffering, of evil in the world, it is a good time to read the book of Job, and then to go on reading the Psalms, looking for comfort that is strength to endure. Also to remember the importunate widow, the importunate friend. Both are stories which Jesus told. Then to pray without ceasing, as Paul urged. And just as there was that interpolation in Job, that triumphant cry, I know that my Redeemer liveth, so we too can know that help will come, that the good will triumph. Bitter though it is today with ice and sleet, the sap will soon be rising in those bare trees down the street from us. Creator God, we praise you for the sap now rising in the trees, for the sweetness that flows from you to us, even when all around us looks bleak, looks lifeless. May we remember your promises always, promises of mercy, of faithfulness through all generations, of love that is stronger than death, of love that brings joy. Open our eyes to signs of your love all around us as we move out into this week, as we pray without ceasing for this broken and hurting world. Into the flow of your mercy we bring our prayers. We pray for the earth. We pray for the people of every nation. We pray for all who are suffering and in pain. We pray for all who mourn. We pray for all who comfort and care. We pray for all who rise like the sap breathing new life and joy into this world. Holy Spirit, move among these prayers and move us to live in response to the prayers of our neighbors. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. This vision of love's reign on earth, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Receive this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Thank you.